Good morning and thank you all for coming today. 48 years ago today, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis. We're gathered here today to honor Dr. King and to consider the question, what would Dr. King think of America in 2016? Our program is sponsored by the Campus Diversity Committee, chaired by Dr. Belinda Dalton Russell. Oh, where's Dr. Russell? She was here. There she is. And uh, we thank you very much for putting this program on. And I thank you for inviting me to return from retirement to, uh, to moderate this. Although I think these are pretty peaceful fellows. I don't think we have to break up. Uh, and you notice, <laughs> you, you notice, folks, we did uh, West Kentucky, Murray State, Murray State, West Kentucky, so they're all mixed up, you know. <laughs> we do like each other, the two campuses did. Um, let me go over a few ground rules to get started. Uh, first, this is being televised. You probably noticed the big cameras back there. So I would beseech you to please silence your cell phones and all the gadgets that make noise. Uh, my students knew I was not a fan of cell phones. And I'm still not. Anyway, and as you leave the room, be careful of the television cameras, and please don't walk in front of the television cameras if you, if you happen to leave early. That's okay. We're going to try to entertain questions and comments in some form. This is very informal. We'll sort that out later on. Uh, my name is Barry Craig. I taught history here for 24 years. Uh, I'm an old, emphasis old, newspaper columnist, and I have returned to my old haunts in the Fourth Estate in retirement. Now let me at this point uh, just kind of go over the basic format of this. Uh, it's four parts. In the first part we're going to address the question, what would Dr. King think of America in 2016? In the second part our panelists are going to address the cause of the Civil War, slavery, and put this in the context of the recent rise of Confederate symbolism, notably the Confederate flag. Now here are our panelists from uh, my left to my right. David Nickel, a professor of philosophy and sociology here at the college. We had adjoining offices for many, many years and I do thank him for putting up with me for a lot of those many years. Yeah, Next is Dr. Great. Brian Clardy, professor of history at Murray State University, my alma mater. And Dwayne Bowen, professor of history at Murray State University. And on the far end is a fellow who wears two hats. Uh, when he's on campus, he wears a professor of political science hat. And of late, he's been in Frankfurt wearing a hat that says State Representative House District 3. Now, let's begin. And again, we're going to, as we go through this, and if you think of questions or comments you would like to have, we're going to figure out some way to get you to uh, to answer those. So don't worry about it. If you've got a question, we'll take care of that. So let's begin with the question, what would Dr. King think of America in 2016? And let's start with Professor Nickel and move this way, if that's OK. OK. That's right. um, of course, this is entirely hypothetical, but I, I think he would in some ways be impressed at how much progress we have made and in other ways be sorely disappointed, and I'm reminded of uh, Thurgood Marshall in his memoirs. Uh, said his one regret, uh, by the way, he was the first Supreme Court Justice and the attorney for the Brown versus Board of Education case that desegregated schools in America. And in his memoirs, he said that uh, that decision to pursue law came from when he was a child and had been sent into town on the bus to run errands for his mother. And when he got to town, he discovered that there was not a restroom he could use. Uh, and he, as he described it, soiled himself and had to ride home in total humiliation. And on that bus ride home, decided he was going to become an attorney and change the system. And he said his one regret was we had made enough progress that young people today would not face the same obstacles, the same level of opposition that he did and would not be as motivated to fight as hard. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot to be done. And the question is, what has to happen to make that transition happen? Dr. Clardy. Well, first of all, to my 
friend and colleague Professor Craig, to Dr. Dalton Russell, and to my colleagues in the WKCTC family, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to make a few remarks before we get into our conversation on, on race in America some 48 years after the assassination of Martin Luther King. To answer the initial question, what would Martin Luther King think? I would argue Dr. King would see our progress as sort of a mixed bag. Since the historic election of Barack Obama to the presidency some seven and a half years ago, the question has been often asked, have we become a post-racial society? To be honest, there are times that I would like to answer that question with a thundering yes. There are more African American students enrolled in colleges, universities, technical and community colleges, and professional schools than at any time in American history. Now this fact alone will foster in the long term a vibrant black middle class for the next several generations. There are far more black elected officials today than at any time since the 1972 uh, black political convention in Gary, Indiana. This is due to the fact that coalition politics and a changing demographic in this country have ensured that there will be a stable African American presence in Congress, state legislatures, um, town government, and so forth. And yes, on the financial side of the equation, there are more black millionaires and billionaires than at any time since Madam C.J. Walker became the first one. Technology has made the world smaller. Younger people are becoming more diverse in their tastes and in their temperament. Now, of course, that's the good news. The bad news that sometimes along comes a Ferguson. Sometimes comes a Charleston a Laquan McDonald, a Sandra Bland, a Tamir Rice, and Trayvon Martin. To further answer the question, there are still vestiges of the old hatreds that raise their heads from time to time. There's still the vitriol of old that expresses itself in our political discourse. Now granted, it's not the same type of hate speech that we heard in the past from people like Cecil Maddox or Theodore Bilbo or George Wallace, but it is there. It is subtle, but the overtones are obvious. So then to answer my own question, are we in a post-racial society? I will answer that with uh, not yet, but someday soon we will. Dr. Bowman. I felt inadequate to uh, answer the question. I grew up in Webster County, Kentucky. Went to uh, graduate from Webster County High School in 1974. And uh, in my high school, there was one African American family. Um, one section of our town uh, had African Americans living in my town. Um, so, uh, full disclosure, I want you to know uh, my upbringing, my background. Uh, I'm one of four professors at Murray State University that signed um, a letter uh, stating that my belief that the Jefferson Davis statue should be removed from the rotunda at the state capitol in Frankfurt. Um, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later in the, in the session. I believe that Martin Luther King, Dr. King would be uh, very, very happy that Barack Obama has been elected was elected to two terms as President of the United States, as the first African-American President of the United States. I believe that uh, Dr. King would be delighted that uh, Condoleezza Rice was appointed as the first African-American to be appointed as uh, Secretary of State uh, 
of the United States. On the other hand, um, I think he would be uh, very, very hurt and very disappointed in other developments in the United States today. My high school history teacher called me up one morning and said, Dwayne, I want to take you to uh, a graveyard in Webster County. Um, it's the Thomas Hobgood Graveyard. It's an unusual graveyard. Uh, it's a family plot. Most graves are laid out east and west. I know that's the way it is in Murray. The graves are laid out east and west. And all the graves in the Thomas Hobgood graveyard are laid out east and west, save one, and that's the Hom Thomas Hobgood grave. And that grave is laid out north and south. And so he came over to my house and his MG midget and picked me up. And we went outside of Dixon down the Manitou Road and uh, pulled over on the side of the road and we went out through the woods and found the Thomas Hobgood graveyard. It's overgrown with periwinkle vines, vinca vines, and we, we brushed those away and finally found maybe 10 graves with 10 grave markers. And it was unusual because every grave and my high school history teacher had to show me the layout of the graveyard. Every grave in that graveyard was laid out east and west, but then he found, helped me find the Thomas Hobgood grave. And sure enough, the headstone was laid out toward the south. And it's the only one, it was catacornered to the other, even, even Mrs. Hobgood was east and west, but the Thomas Hobgood grave was north and south with a headstone toward the south. And then my high school history teacher explained that in his will, Thomas Hobgood had uh, written out very clearly in his will that he wanted to be buried north and south, laid out north and south with his head facing the south. Furthermore, he put in his will that he wanted his musket to be buried by his side. Apparently, his family carried out his wishes. And he explained furthermore in his will that he wanted to be laid out this way so that on resurrection morning, he could rise out, rise up out of his grave with his rifle in his hand so that he could shoot toward those damn Yankees in the north. He was an unreconstructed rebel. Now how many of y'all know, how many of y'all know of unreconstructed rebels in Kentucky today? Anybody? I do. I know a lot of unreconstructed rebels. Some of them are in my family. Some of them are in my town. And, I'm, and I believe that uh, Dr. King would be very, very disappointed in how many unreconstructed rebels are still in our world today, are still in our nation today, that still have um, Neanderthal beliefs about race and even about slavery. And I would uh, think that Dr. King would be very, very disappointed that his dream about society and about issues of race had not come further since his assassination. I believe he'd be very, very disappointed about that. Professor Watkins. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Craig. Honored to be with you and appreciate y'all coming. And Honored to be selected to serve on this panel. In 2014, I attended the 50th anniversary of the March on Frankfurt, in which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, the lead marcher and keynote speaker. And I got to meet Senator Georgia Powers, who served in the state Senate 
uh, for several decades actually and she was one of four people who spent uh, the, uh, the last day of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life with him in Memphis. And so it was a real honor to be in her presence and to get to visit with her uh, for a bit. And every time I go to Washington, D.C., I always go to the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Monument. It's very imposing and it's very humbling to stand there and think of such a great human being and his legacy of what he has meant for this country and the good I think were he alive today, uh, he would have uh, mixed emotions of, uh, about uh, the progress. Uh, some uh, numbers, uh, in 1965, 43% of black families live below the poverty rate. Uh, it was hard to get more recent numbers, but 24.7% in 2004, almost in half, when uh, for all Americans the rate was 12.7%, but because of the lingering effects of the last recession, it's actually a little higher than that. The adult African-American unemployment rate in 1968 was 8.8%. Today it's 9% as of March 2016. The teenage black unemployment rate in 1968 was between, uh, say between 40 and 45% during that time frame. Today it's not a whole lot lower than that, usually running 35 to 40%. The adult white unemployment rate is 4.4% as of last month, about half the unemployment rate for adult African-American. College degrees, well, at least a two-year degree, 27.6% uh, for African-Americans, 43.9% for whites, 23.4% for Native Americans, 198 for Latinos, and 59.4% for Asian-Americans. Uh, African-Americans holding at least age 25 and above, holding at least a four-year college degree in 1968 was a little less than 5%. In 2014, it was 19.7%. Today, 3.2 million African Americans hold a bachelor's degree, 1.078 million hold a master's degree, and then you have about 300,000 who hold professional or doctorate, doctorate degrees. So in total, 4,579,000 out of 40 million African Americans hold a four-year degree or higher. That number continues to climb uh, uh, rather rapidly. Um, African-American-owned businesses today total 2.6 million, well, in 2012, that's a record. Uh, it's hard to find an exact number, but uh, uh, different sites listed about 6 million uh, privately held businesses in this country that actually employ uh, people. Uh, there are somewhere from uh, 18 to 23 million, depending on which side I looked at, of total businesses, but all the rest above approximately 6 million are one, um, uh, one owner uh, business with no employees. 2014, the um, annual median black household income was 35,398, national median was 53,657. On a very positive note, in 1960, there were approximately 1,000 elected black public officials in America. Today, there are over 9,000. Uh, and, and even in conservative Kentucky, the numbers keep growing. We just elected Jeff Taylor from Christian County, a great friend that used to live in Paducah, been a friend for mine about 30 years, and he won 60 to 40 percent. And uh, out of all the committee chairs in Frankfort, currently four uh, African Americans chair committees in the state house, so that is a record and well beyond their representation in the House. So I, I think it's a mixed bag. If Dr. King would, were alive today, he'd be thrilled that uh, America elected its first African-American president and Barack Obama with uh, more than 50 percent margin, the first president to win in several elect presidential elections, that uh, larger percentage of the vote, and re-elected uh, with a good margin again over 50 percent. Um, and, and would be uh, thrilled that we have made progress, but would also realize that the struggle's not over, that we still have a ways to go uh, to try to bring about a greater degree of economic parity uh, in, in this country. And so there is work to be done. Uh, but uh, we uh, try to carry on his legacy and, and try to move forward in this country as uh, we believe he would want us to. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Watkins. And I agree with our panelists. We have come far, but we have far to go. I look around this room today, and I'm 66 years old, and I believe I'm the oldest person in this room. I remember Jim Crow. Who's, who can top me? <laughs> Gosh, you all don't look it. You really don't. And I'm not running for election. 
I'm running for the county line. This guy's running for election right here. <laughs> but I think you'll back me up on what I have to say. I grew up in Mayfield, still live in Mayfield. Uh, segregation was unbelievably rigid. You young folks have no idea what this was like. I was maybe 12 years old when I came in physical contact with the first African-American child. I grew up in a segregated working class neighborhood. I went to a segregated school. I had never physically contacted an African-American child until one day, Lou Davis, who picked up our trash, he actually had a mule attached to a wagon, had car wheels on it, and Lou's son came. And we played together in the backyard. I showed him my new Bell telephone truck. Mm -hmm. And we played baseball. I had never physically come in contact with an African-American child. That's what things were like in Mayfield. Buell Covington's restaurant was the top eatery in town, such as it was. African-Americans could not eat in Mule Covington's restaurant except in the kitchen, or they could get a takeout in the back door, out the back door. That was the same in Paducah. In the Graves County Courthouse, there were four toilets for white men, white women, and colored men, and colored women. You remember the song, sign, sign, everywhere a sign? That was Jim Crow America. Everywhere you went in the South and in the border states like Kentucky, it was white, it was colored. Bus stations had separate waiting rooms. Hospitals had separate waiting rooms. My, my grandmother was dying in 1964 in the old Mayfield Hospital. And my brother and I decided to uh, ride the elevator. That's what kids do. And we rolled down to the basement and the door opened up and there was a whole room full of African American people. That was the colored ward of Mayfield High School. Cemeteries were segregated. One historian wrote that a white southerner's idea of heaven had two turnstiles, one marked white, one marked colored. An awful lot of white southerners didn't believe African Americans had souls and went to heaven anyway. In the state of Georgia, there were two witness Bibles, one for African Americans and one for whites. Not that an African American could testify against a white anyway. Mm. That's what life was like. This is Kentucky. This is not Mississippi. But there were an awful lot of lynchings in Kentucky as well. In Graves County, McCracken County, all over this area. So Dr. King would be tremendously pleased to see that that has changed. But I agree with my panelists. We've got a long way to go. There are an awful lot of unreconstructed rebels in this state and in this nation. So while we have come far, we've got a ways to go. Now the second phase of our program will deal with the causes of the Civil War. And if our political scientist and sociologist philosopher would rather defer to the historians on that, let's allow them to do that. And then we'll jump in and talk about this in the context of the Confederate flag. Uh, I guess you're always a historian. I'm retired, but I still, I guess, consider myself a historian. Uh, emeritus, they call, they call us emeritus professors, which means old and retired. <laughs> and I see one in the back of the room who's just about to uh, get that status, and uh, you're going to love it. Got a thumbs up, absolutely. Before we begin this second part, let me just share with you what two 21st century Civil War scholars and the Confederates themselves said about slavery in the Civil War. To put it quite simply, slavery and race were absolutely critical elements in the coming of the war, wrote historian and author Charles B. Dew of Williams College. Professor Dew wrote an outstanding book called Apostles of Disunion, one of the very best Civil War books I've ever read. It's only about that thick if you don't like to read, and if you want the details, I'll give it to you after. My copy is well thumbed and underlined. Now, when the Confederates seceded from the Union, they took great pains great pains to officially explain why they seceded. South Carolina was the first state to secede, left the Union in December of 1860, and the South Carolinians said they're leaving the Union because, quote, the northern free states have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. Who was that man? Abraham Lincoln, a Kentucky native. 
When South Carolina seceded from the Union, the Carolina secessionists issued an address to the people of the slave states. It's a long address. It's online. You can read it. And the last line reads, we invite you to join us in forming a confederacy of slave-holding states. And they capitalized slave-holding and states. Mississippi secessionists declared, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. We must either submit to the degradation and to the loss of property worth four billions of money, or we must secede from the Union. Texas secessionists denounced, quote, the debasing doctrine of the equality of all men, irrespective of race and color, a doctrine at war with nature in opposition to the experience of mankind and in violation of the plainest revelations of divine law. The Confederate Constitution specifically sanctioned slavery. It also guaranteed slavery's expansion to all territory that the Confederates might annex. In writing their Constitution, the secessionists used the U.S. Constitution as a guide. But from the U.S. Constitution, they purged the text of all the ambivalences, compromises, and hedges about slavery, according to Stephanie McCurry professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. She added, the framers of the Confederate Constitution, quote, set out to make something that had in fact never existed. An explicitly pro-slavery pro constitution for an explicitly pro-slavery and anti-democratic country. These are the words of the Confederates themselves. It's online, it's in books, read it for yourself. Now, let's jump in and have the historians, unless you folks want to comment on the cause of the war yourself? I, I would like to add Go that right it, it is an amazing thing to me that we even have to discuss this causes of the Civil War. Uh, but I do remember I graduated from high school in 1975 and I remember being taught that the Civil War was not about slavery in class. And then when I got to college, found out that it, it was about states' rights, but right to do what? Well, to own slaves. Uh, and I would think we should not be having this conversation now, except that I still get students showing up in my class who are insistent that it was not about slavery. And I don't know how many times you have to beat a dead horse uh, to get this through, but continue. Well, I would also add, too, that one of the gr greatest fallacies to come out of historical thought in this country was the cult of the lost cause. And that is where a lot of this comes from, especially when we're talking about reverencing the Confederate battle flag, when we're talking about referencing the Southern way of life, when we start talking about movies that really uh, have crystallized this fiction like Gone with the Wind and Birth of a Nation and so forth. So yes, there's a direct relationship between culture, remembrance, race, attitudes on race, and also the questions about the humanity of the enslaved. There's a direct relationship between the two, and we also see it come about in our political discourse, and I'll have more to say about that later. If I jump in very quickly, we old teachers are always recommending books to read. Mm -hmm. I recommend highly Ann Marshall's Creating a Confederate Kentucky. Yes. This book is excellent. It goes into great detail as to how this state was a loyal state. Kentucky did not secede from the Union. There was only one part of Kentucky that was pro-Confederate. You matter which part that was? It was the Jackson Purchase. But the rest of the state was Union, about two to one. But Ann Marshall's Creating a Confederate Kentucky uh, is an outstanding book that I recommend. Now, off to uh, Gerald or Dwayne. Which one are we going to hop in now? OK, well, um, I'll say this. Um, Let's go to the end of the war. That's fine. The, the end of the war. Um, and you know how it ended. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and uh, the South won the Civil War. Mm. <laughs> Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and the South won the Civil War. Right. right. Well, so uh, we'll return to the causes of the, of, of the war. And uh, Dr. Clardy mentioned 
the lost cause, the cause or the lost cause after the war, the lost cause. Well, what was the cause? Well, uh, if the cause was for the South to maintain white superiority in the South, then after a brief few years of reconstruction in the South, where at bayonet rule of military reconstruction, African Americans were allowed civil rights, the right to vote at the points of bayonets at the polling places, but then after the election of 1876 and the compromise of 1877, using that theological term, redemption, Southern state after Southern state was redeemed, which Southerners, white Southerners meant that those states were back into the power of the ex-Confederates, the ex-white Confederates, and through grandfather clauses and poll taxes and other means uh, African Americans were disenfranchised and white superiority was again in place. Then white superiority was maintained and the South did indeed win the Civil War. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse and the South won the Civil War, at least until the second reconstruction of Dr. King and Rosa Parks and Malcolm X and all the rest. At least you all didn't start throwing things at me like my students do when I make that statement. But do you see what I'm saying? If the cause and then the lost cause well, maybe it wasn't a lost cause for a white racist because blacks were again disenfranchised after only a window of the first reconstruction when so-called redemption took place. Professor Watkins. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Craig. My upbringing was different. I grew up at 1210 Tennessee Street on the south side, two blocks from the Oscar Cross Boys and Girls Club, where I played basketball uh, many times. Um, Oscar Cross was a friend of mine. He was a great gentleman. I tell people I was 18 years old before I knew I was white. Uh, <laughs> Concerning the Confederate flag, uh, when I served on the Paducah City Commission, a group decided to raise the Confederate flag in McCracken County. I proposed a resolution before the city condemning that action. That was no place for that flag and would do a big disservice to this community and make job recruitment all the more difficult as well as offending uh, an awful lot of people. Uh, it passed unanimously, and Richard, Commissioner Richard Abraham, who's with us here today, voted uh, for that resolution also, and I thank you, my friend. Uh, Kentucky never seceded. For those who fly that flag, Kentucky never seceded from the Union. It is not our heritage in this state. That flag should not be flying over any state capital, and it sure as the heck shouldn't be flying at exit 16 in McCracken County. Put it in a museum where it belongs and let's move forward. Uh, but uh, that flag is offensive um, and, and should be in a museum not flying over any public structure or private land. And uh, so uh, that's my position. As they say in the British Parliament, hear, hear. Uh, any questions or comments from the crowd? We'll figure out some way to do this. Uh, so if you got any comments, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, speak loudly, I think I can, uh, can relay it. Well, Charles Hamilton, uh, getting back to Dr. King, I've come to the conclusion back since I grew up in that era and served in the Vietnam War, 
that I think he would be dissatisfied with us as a race of people more so we accomplish uh, quite a bit from his sacrifice but the vast majority we have very few that are willing to step out as they have moved on financially and otherwise but no one is really willing to step forward after they have gotten theirs they are satisfied with their portion and not concerned about reaching back as a vast community. We live in McCracken County and we got one black teacher in the whole McCracken County system. In Baducas City, we got three black police officers. And it seems like everyone is that have been put ahead are not willing to sacrifice any of that to enhance the further cause of diversity in the city. We have to remember one of the causes, one of the last, well, two of the great causes that Dr. King took on in the, at the end of his life, and I think one of them got him killed. First one was, of course, poverty. Remember, he was in Memphis supporting sanitation workers. Very few civil rights leaders wanted to take that cause on, much less raise questions about the credibility of Lyndon Johnson's poverty program. He considered it to be insufficient. And the second major issue Dr. King took on was the war in Vietnam. Now, folks, it was okay if, as long as Dr. King was talking about Negro affairs. That was okay. Desegregating toilets, lunch counters, and all that. But when Dr. King started getting into United States foreign policy and questioning the motives and the motivation of the Johnson administration and gave a blistering critique of colonialism at the uh, speech in New York City, actually 49 years ago today, uh, I believe that he signed his death warrant. Now to your question, to your comment, there are a lot of African American professionals and others who are willing to reach back into the community and be of help. There are a lot who, like, take some of the young people in the Black Lives Matter movement. Many of them are very literate, very educated, willing to put their necks on the line. But some of our folk also need to be willing to accept that help and to accept uh, folks coming back into the community because I hate to say this, there is a growing anti-intellectualism within our community. Uh, a lot of our folks tend to be very negative toward folks who did graduate from school, who did go on to succeed in business. And there is this riff, this is huge riff that, um, uh, that Booker T, not Booker T. Washington, Carter G. Woodson addressed way back in the 1930s. So until that part is resolved, you're not going to have a whole lot of folks wanting to get on board and put their necks on the line because no one wants to be totally rejected by their own people. I, I've endured that. I've endured that. I endure it still. It's an ongoing, ongoing thing. But the thing is, uh, there are a lot of people who are willing to reach back and help the community. And you are right. You've got some folks who totally washed their hands of the community and and there's that's that's just all there is to that. It is what it is. Anyone else on the panel? I, uh, I would add to that just <clears throat> brief comment that back when we had de jure discrimination, which was it was codified in law, and by the way, that is very easy to remedy compared to de facto discrimination, which means it's just happening because of the way we interact with each other, the way we think. All it takes is an act of Congress to change the laws that's gone. Uh, compared to the changing the way people think, getting an act of Congress is a simple thing. Um, today, it's not a uniform sort of discrimination. Um, it is class-based. It is very much following class lines. And we have, even today, uh, legacy discriminations in place where most people don't make the distinction between income and wealth. Income is your paycheck, wealth is your property. If you're going to buy a home, start a business, uh, do anything to advance yourself, uh, you need wealth. You need property to put up for collateral. If your family history is such that no one in your family has ever owned property, no one in your family has ever been allowed to own property, even though you've got income inequality now, you don't have the wealth and it's hard to translate that income into wealth. Absolutely. 
Uh, that's where we have programs to try to address that, uh, to allow low interest loans, those kind of things, and all that's been gutted. But a lot of this, there's no law in place. It's a glass ceiling across the board. The experiences of people in the working class and the lower class are very different from the experiences of people in the upper middle class and the upper class. And if you're in the upper class or upper middle class today, being a minority, a quote unquote minority, is not nearly the same thing as it is if you're in the working class or the underclass. And we tend to, it's largely about the money. It's about access. Uh, we don't make the distinction between the critics of this, people we unfortunately are electing into office now, when they talk about equality, they're talking about equality of outcome, which by anybody's estimate is unfair. Uh, some people work harder than others. Some people have better luck than others. Uh, the real question is about equality of opportunity. It's equality of access to education, equality of access to health care, and those are the things you make it equal, and then you've got a fair competition, everybody starting from the same line. And that's what we're not getting uh, because of this difference in legacy inequalities that are still there and they're very difficult to overcome. Uh, you can equalize the incomes fairly quickly by ending the discrimination, the de jure discrimination, but it can take generations to overcome that legacy discrimination and get people back in the system or in the system for the first time and give them a hand up. Anyone from this side? Well, I would just say that uh, Professor Nichols is exactly right. You have to give people opportunity uh, or, or they, can't, uh, they can't ever move uh, up uh, socioeconomically. And, and uh, the great equalizer for all of us to be in a position to do that is education. And so we have got to provide opportunities uh, through scholarships, through grants, through uh, low interest loans um, to allow uh, people to move up uh, from the poor class uh, by allowing, giving them an opportunity to get a, a college degree or learn a skill, trade, or craft. Uh, that is your key to a higher standard of living for all of us. And when we reduce uh, monies uh, allotted for uh, Pell Grants and different opportunities, scholarships for the needy, which uh, is one of the battles we're fighting in Frankfurt right now, and, and uh, is, is uh, giving people an opportunity and, and you know, trying to gut higher education by 22.5% uh, is not the way to move people from the lower classes to the middle or upper classes. Uh, you're taking opportunities away from people rather than giving them opportunities. I grew up uh, very poor. My dad and mom both, as I've said before, are a lot smarter than me, but my dad had a sixth grade education and was a custodian. My mom had an eighth grade education and they had nine children to raise and uh, so we lived in a house that wasn't fit to live in. We never had air conditioning. We didn't have running hot water for years and never had a TV till, uh we were quite older. And uh, But uh, and I didn't, there was no one in our neighborhood, some good people, but there was no one there who had a college degree. Most didn't have a high school diploma. And I never thought nor believed, I didn't have any money, that I would have an opportunity to go to college. And consequently, I didn't start until I was 23 because of that belief. I didn't think I could pass the first class and I had no money. <laughs> and I didn't know where to access money and, and that was the opportunity. So. Now, thank God I discovered that there was, and, and it opened up doors for me that I wouldn't have been able to walk through otherwise. And so that is, therein lies the hope for all of us, uh, is to have an opportunity to learn a skill, a trade, get a degree uh, where we can uh, do something we enjoy and, and move up the socioeconomic ladder and have some degree of success. And when we get there, yes, sir, we need to look back and we need to pull others up and give them opportunities and mentor young people uh, and help uh, provide opportunities so that they can move up likewise. Uh, I think that is most important and, and that's really the key, I think, for all of us to be able to uh, move forward. Go ahead. Uh, this gentleman has hand up here. Yes, I would like to address and talk about the historical aspects of the Civil War and all that. 
I read a lot of history, and a great man once said that history is a fable to which all parties agree. The root cause of the Civil War wasn't slavery, it was cotton. Free labor versus slave labor. Because you know, the South economy was built on cotton. And you know, if the oil workers were slaves, gas would be a nickel a gallon. And that is where it was with, uh, with cotton in the South. The other just on top of the equality. There is no such thing as equality. We're all different. And anything different is going to be treated different, good or bad. If a man with two heads walked in that door right now, he'd be treated much different than anybody else in here. Of course, it doesn't mean that we can't all get along. But so much of the race issue today is politics, pure and simple. And this being an election year, it is the bottom line. And politics gets into everything. It gets into religion. Matter of fact, religion and politics are one and the same. Now, I'm involved with two churches in Paducah. One is very, very political, the other is not at all. And it's just a human fact that everybody is not going to like each other. It could be a color <coughs> thing, a sex thing, or anything else. Nobody's equal, but we can all get along. And I'm going to shut up. Martin Luther King famously said that the law cannot make a man love me, but he can certainly stop the law. The law can stop somebody from lynching me, and that's a huge difference. Yes, the war was about slavery. It was about maintaining the Southern way of life. It was about maintaining white supremacy. And yes, cotton was an integral part of that, but you also had slave breeding slave catching, you had a lot of the slave-based materials which were insured by the insurance companies and the banks. And let's not leave off some of those northern companies that profited from slavery. So you're asking people at the end of the day to give all of that up? All of that? This is a conversation that started even long before the Constitutional Convention. It reached its apex there. You get the three-fifths um, uh, three clause and all that. that. Yeah, that comes from that. That's an issue that they did not resolve until we got to the battlefield. And, and, but I will agree with you on this point. It has become political. And it didn't just start with Donald Trump. It goes back long before Donald Trump. It goes all, even long back, going back to before George Wallace. Uh, the person who shouted the N-word the loudest was the one who got elected to office in the South. Well, now you ain't got to shout the N-word. All you got to do is use those certain code words, which Lee Atwater and others taught politicians to do in the 80s. So you're right. There's nothing new under the sun. And since you mentioned religion, well, I fancy myself to be somewhat of a theologian. And I do know that slavery was justified in the Bible and racism was justified in the Bible. You go all the way back to the Hamitic curse and carry it forward. And God is the love of the Father. That's why I don't see why we single out the Christian flag to be slave owned, and I mean the Confederate flag and not the Christian flag. Because God set slavery up and there's reason for it. I, I just really wanted to add real quick. Uh, you said we're not all equal. Uh, you're exactly right in terms of outcome, mm. in terms of abilities. Uh, take my philosophy class. We'll read John Locke, and I'll show you real quick that clause that worked its wind into our founding documents that says all men are created equal it was not talking about outcomes. It was not talking about abilities. It was talking about that the kings have no divine rights that the rest of us do not have. By natural law, each of us is born a human being and therefore has certain abilities, uh, certain potentials, and we all have the basic right to actualize our own potentials. So this comes back to the distinction I was referring to earlier. Do not get sucked into this thing about it's equality of opportunities. That's what nobody, nobody is proposing that. It's equality of opportunity, not outcome. Access to education, access to health care, and if you were in a ruling class and you were going to say, it, unless you can afford access to education, you don't deserve it, then all you're doing is safeguarding your own position and Bingo. excluding others. Bingo. If you want a fair competition, if you want a true meritocracy, where everybody's position in society is based on your own efforts, your own lifestyle, the way you have lived, then everybody has to start from the same starting line. Everybody has to have access to the same education the same basic opportunities, and then it's a fair competition over what we do with it. And you will have unequal outcomes, but nobody is being discriminated based on any characteristic you did not determine for yourself. Uh, any comments from the side of you? Okay. 
Commissioner Abraham. Yes. A couple of days. Uh, one, I pretty much grew up the same way uh, Professor Watkins did. There uh, wasn't a lot of education, higher education in my family. Um, to address what Dr. King, uh, how would he feel about where the United States is now as far as race? Um, Dr. King set out to change the infrastructure of the United States as it regarded to race. Um, you talked about opportunities. Uh, when Dr. King was called for the, uh, the mission that he was called for, uh, the opportunities for African Americans were nil um, uh, at best. He set out to change the infrastructure. Uh, he changed the infrastructure, uh, not only him, but there was a lot of other people that came when he realized when the TV cameras zoomed in and saw what was happening that moved uh, individuals across color lines to, uh, to get themselves involved in the movement. Uh, we saw evidence of that. Uh, as you're as commenting on reconstruction, you can hold a gun to someone's head and make them do whatever you want them to do. Um, but when those guns are gone, uh, uh, folks' behaviors, their, their, their character seems to come back. You can't, you know, I, I say all the time, uh, you can't rise above your character. It, it, it is what it is. I can hold your head facing the north, but I can't make your eyes go there. You understand what I'm saying? So when you look at when you look at where we've come, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, when you look at the infrastructure of the United States as it regards uh, opportunity for African Americans, it's changed. It's changed dramatically over the years. Now, what individuals? You will always have individuals in positions of power with very small minds, and they will use that influence to further their agenda. That crosses color lines. So as individuals, it all comes back, and I, I really believe this, it all comes back to a decision. Is it going to, I don't even use the word hard anymore. I, I'm a personal trainer, and I, I, tell my, I tell my clients this, I don't use the word hard. I use the word challenging. Because when you use the word challenging, it puts a mirror in your face. Are you up for it? To get to where you want to be, is it going to be easy? Most things are probably not that you really want to invest in. It will be challenging. Are you willing to do what you need to do to get to where you want to get to? Will you encounter individuals with small minds in large places? Yes, you will. What are you going to do? Are you going to quit? Because our history, whether it's black, white, Hispanic, Asian, is filled with individuals facing huge obstacles that they refuse to quit. You have two people looking at the same situation. One person will look at that situation and say, this is a waste of time. The other person will look at that exact same situation and say, that's an opportunity. It comes back, for me, in my opinion, it comes down to your ability to make a decision, to decide if this is what I want to better my family, then that's what I'm going to have to do. We are all people of overcomers. The, the, um, uh, the Hebrews were enslaved people. There are, there are cultures on this, on this planet right now that there are folks that are enslaved in 2016 that are still, and they're having, you think in their, in, their, in, their, in their homes or in small groups, they're having these same discussions we're having. Only difference is they're, they're looking right at it. Now you talk about cold words. There have always been cold words. There's always, there's always been a, 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 a spirit, a human spirit, man in humanity to man, that I'm better than you. I, I'll say this and I'll wrap this up. I, saw, I was watching a movie the other night called Pride. And I don't know if you, uh, some of you guys are familiar. It's about the Philadelphia Recreation Department having a swim team, and, and then Terrence Howard is just one of my favorite guys. He's in it. Bottom line is this: they were going to their first swim meet, all black, 
swim team, all white swim team, right? This is what they had in common. The black kids thought that just because they were black, they were going to go in that, to that swim meet and beat these white boys just because they were black. The white kids thought just because they were white, they were going to beat these black kids in the swim, in the swim pool. The white boys won, not because they were white, because they were better swimmers. They were better athletes. So the mirror was put up. Okay, is this acceptable for you? Do you really believe that these people are better than you are? Well, what happened? Go back, they practiced, they became more disciplined, they made better choices, they understood the big picture, and they went on to, to win, uh, to win the, 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 city, the state swimming championship. It all comes back to us as with us individuals to decide. I'm not going to let your, um, I'm going to put a word, I'm not going to let your, uh, you're, not, you're, not real, you're not real confident, your lack of confidence, you don't understand me. So that's the whole thing about prejudice. I'm going to prejudge you because I don't know you and there's something there that scares me. So I'm going to prejudge you, racism, I'm going to not like you or I'm not going to give you an opportunity because you're a different race. Right? So I'm not going to let your inadequacy, you're not going to visit that on me. I have a plan that I want to accomplish. And I have a family that I, that I want to provide for. So that's your problem. Now, when it becomes an issue where I can't get a house because I'm married to a white woman and I got children that don't look like your children, then I'm going to take the proper avenue to deal with that. And when I was talking to my, to my friend, Gerald Walken, he was talking about the challenges that he has in Franklin, trying to get things moved. Now you, have a, you got a Republican administration as opposed to before you had a Democratic uh, administration. There are some important uh, issues on the table. And I come up with him, man, you got to make it work. You got to find a way. You got to find a way to work. Is it going to be easy? Nope. It's going to be very challenging, but I think you're up for it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. If you all could address, I think it's kind of what they're talking about, you know, with what Martin Luther King did in the Civil Rights Bill. Now, there has been numerous revisions, additions to the Civil Rights Bill. None of them have worked. They've all said good words, but none of them have had teeth in it to actually make changes. The bayonet wasn't there, which goes to the heart of the people. Um, and then the second thing is, we talk about opportunity, but we continue to graduate students from high school. Um, and in Paducah in particular, um, the white students graduate from high school Around 80% are ready to go to college and to work. The black students, there have been some improvements in the last couple of years, but it's still only like 40% of black students are ready to go for high school and, and work. It doesn't make any difference how much opportunity you give people if they're not ready, they can't take advantage of the opportunities that's given. It doesn't make any difference from the political realm what is written in the statutes if you can't carry out the statutes and make it work. Anybody want to jump in first? It's all a matter of what the community privileges. If we uplift and I've seen this in music videos I've seen it in I've heard it in music I've heard it in daily conversation as long as there is a mentality and this is not an over it's not an overarching thing I don't mean to generalize at all but as long as you have this undercurrent that says that you are acting white because you can read and write 
And as long as you have this undercurrent that says that you're trying to be better than someone else because you're trying to succeed, as long as that's there, you're always going to consistently have that problem. As long as you have a situation where the gangbanger is celebrated over the student who wants to become a lawyer, yeah, that is, that is an undercurrent that there. It's not really as pervasive as the media would like us to, to, to think, but we hear it. We see it. We see it in the play out in popular culture. That is the one thing racism cannot address. That is the one thing that all the laws and all the legislation in the world cannot overcome. I would recommend to all of you to read Carter G. Woodson's The Miseducation of the Negro. It came out in the 1930s. And if you read it and you take out some of the colloquial language out of it, I guarantee you a lot of it you could apply to 2016. great hero of mine and uh, before Dr. King was W.B. Du Bois and, and, and Dr. Du Bois, the, the first black PhD at Harvard University, pushed for the influence of the talented 10th and he pushed for ceaseless agitation he called it and I wonder if um, you know, uh, and I don't want to. I don't want to speak out of out of term. But you know, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Clardy, is a, is a great example to me. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Abraham, you know, though though, your example. You're the talented tenth. You're the talented tenth. And the folks in this room, you're the talented tenth. Uh, to lead by by your example, you know, by ceaseless agitation. You know, that's what Dr. Du Bois talked about. Absolutely. You know, um, the upper ten percent intellectually, the, it's the intellectual elite. I think is what he was talking about in the 1890s in the early 20th century, uh, leading uh, by example, and he pushed for, you know, immediate change, not gradual change, but immediate change for the black community, immediate civil rights, immediate education opportunity, immediate economic opportunity. Dr. Clardy, am I speaking out of turn? No, you're, 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 you're spot on. The flip side of that, of course, is Booker T. Washington. Who, who advocated uh, self-help and, and, and so forth, and the idea of casting down your buckets where you are. A lot of people want to, to make it seem like Du Bois and Washington were on polar opposites. Really, they believed in pr pretty much the same thing. They had different approaches, and this was part of the dialogue. African Americans have never, as a, as, as a whole, thought in a monolith. It was not all Booker T. It wasn't all Martin Luther King. It wasn't all Marcus Garvey. There is a huge conduit of ideas that fuel into that now. Yes, Du Bois was exactly spot on with the talent of the 10th, and he also recognized that there were structural barriers to succeeding. He said so in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. So both Du Bois and Washington had realistic assessments of what the problem was. And I think my colleague, Dr. Boland, hit the nail on the head. It is going to be the talented 10th. I would like to see it be the talented 30% myself that will take this nation into an active, positive direction. And I thank my, doc, my colleague, Dr. Boland, for raising Du Bois, because I think you cannot have a conversation about Martin Luther King unless you've talked about Du Bois. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a statement that uh, has served me well over the years, and I will say it last, and I'll try to make it short. I was born in South Carolina, raised in Kentucky, uh, my great-grandfather was a great uh, integral part of the tobacco wars in eastern Kentucky, if any of you are familiar. Uh, last name was Jacobs, which is Jewish, which was, was a contradiction in itself because the tobacco wars were perpetuated by the Klan. And he was on the Klan side. Uh, we were raised, uh, I was raised by a bevy of teachers 
which education and exposure brings about truth and understanding, which has shown the difference from his thinking unto where I am now. There's a lot of frustration in our country today. Now, I'm a Christian, so I base a lot of my statements and belief and success upon that fact, which those of you all who are Christians understand the teaching, which was the same as Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, there's a lot of frustration now, a lot of things going on, man's inhumanity to man, but the one thing that seems to be prevalent over everything of all the success I've had, because I've had children who, cultures who have a racial problem, would mostly call them either mixed or black. Uh, I went to schools, fought battles to make sure no color was put on my daughter's applications at school. Human, all the time. From the Catholic schools all the way up to college, that's what we did. They're very successful now with the right way of thinking. They go where they want to go because they belong where they belong. The thing we must always remember is we must speak the truth <coughs> in love. That's where we fail a whole lot today. A whole lot. There's so many truths out there, but if you don't speak it in love, you're not going to succeed. And, and that's my statement. That's, you know, I see the Black Lives Matter. I'm thinking, yeah, that's good. And someone said, all lives matter. And I said, that's better. And then someone else said, no, but that's racist. I'm like, no. no. We have to remember to speak the truth in love because the truth will stand. The love is what's going to change the minds. We changed all our families. Richard had people on his side of the family. I had people on my side of the family. We did not expose our children to because their way of thinking was not something we felt would be beneficial to our children. We didn't speak ill of these people to our children, but we say so-and-so feels this way and so-and-so feels that way. We don't agree with that, but we respect them because they're grown and we do what we can in love when it can be made a difference. So that's it. We just have to remember to speak the truth in love. Everyone here has had so much to say, and I don't know other people here have so many thoughts on their mind. I don't like being made to think I'm a racist just because I'm Caucasian. I don't like that. You know, when Richard and I go places together around here, it's great. But there's some places we go and we're standing in line and people want to wait on different people. Nobody ever imagines we're together. You know, we. I've gone to where he came from in Newburn, Kentucky, I mean Newburn, Tennessee. It was very racist. But I've been to racist places too. So love. We've got to remember that. Truth will stand on its own. Love makes a difference. Any comments from the uh, panel? Now we have set aside considerable time for your last questions and comments. Now come on. Ah, here we go. The gentleman right here, and then we'll get to you. Go right ahead, sir. <coughs> The uh, Charles Hewitt, uh, Reverend Charles Hewitt from Grace Episcopal Church. Uh, when you talk about the lost cause, uh, the little history uh, I try to study uh, when I can, I, I remind myself that Lincoln had immense pressure to get the Emancipation Proclamation through. And uh, he did a sort of lot of work to get that done. When the war ended, like all wars, we have to have a process of finding middle ground and reconstruction of a nation. Do you think that the lost cause uh, that you were talking about is some forms of compromise uh, of trying, uh, instead of perpetuating the war, uh, and considering the continuation of hate uh, amongst brothers and sisters uh, within a country, was that part of that compromise? And then because no one else wanted to have the, no one had the energy to continue to work on uh, that kind of reconstruction uh, to help better the country, uh, we all just said, let's just calm down and forget about it for a while. Can you well, comment about that? On one end, you have the lost cause, but you also had those northern politicians who wa walked away from the table and we did not uphold their end of the deal in so far as the guarantee of civil rights. Uh, some of the legislation proposed by Charles Sumner and, and others, that is Stevens, absolutely went in nowhere. And then you have that change of administration, as my colleague uh, pointed out, in 1876, uh, with the election of Rutherford, if you want to, I'll put it in quotes, the election of Rutherford B. Hayes to the presidency, that's a major turning point because up till then you did have positive administrations such as Ulysses S. Grant with a very strong civil rights record. That changes after the election of 1976 and the compromise. I think Lincoln really wanted healing, 
because uh, the plan that he had in place for bringing the nation back together again, the, the so-called 10% plan, was a very uh, lenient plan to bring the nation back together again. Uh, then he, then with his assassination, you know, uh, the radical Republicans in, in Congress had a very different plan. Uh, they wanted rather to punish, to punish the South. And so uh, th their plan had made it very, uh, very much more difficult to, to bring the nation back together again. They, they, uh, Lincoln, of course, it, you know, you, you've seen those photographs of Lincoln at the beginning of his administration. You, you know, look at Barack Obama's uh, a photograph of him at the beginning of his administration in Barack Obama. He's still a very handsome man, but, you know, the, the graying <laughs> of his hair. Look at Lincoln at the beginning of his administration. Look at Lincoln at the end of his administration. Look at any president. Yes. Look at George W. Bush at the beginning of his administration, at the end of his administration. Yes. You know, he's so war weary, and he knew that, that the nation was war weary. So he wanted peace. He wanted to bring the nation back together again. His plan was thwarted because of uh, the assassination. And so the, 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 the radicals' plan for Reconstruction was very, very different. And uh, uh, that their plan was more to, 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 to punish the South. Uh, you know, for uh, as, as, as they saw, you know, and probably rightfully so, they were responsible for it. To follow up with that, then, do you think that uh, with the amount of angst that we have in our country currently, I believe over of some of that that has not been addressed, that we continue to try to uh, unfortunately use other political events or issues that raise those angsts uh, even further. And we see those even uh, with uh, the idea of taking my gun away, uh, or gun rights, for instance. Uh, a lot of anxiety comes up when that topic comes up. And along with, uh, recently with the, the Confederate flag, uh, the anxiety level seems to rise uh, again because we, we haven't addressed these issues, and it's not necessarily about racism. Uh, it, I think it is a it's an address that we've forgotten that and maybe it is racism, uh, but I think there's we haven't addressed the anxiety of our of a nation yet from the Civil War. Two things: first, a lot of those anxieties, hatreds, and resentments never ever went away. That's one. For many years after the Reconstruction period, particularly in the South, the South always voted in one particular block. You had the Democratic Solid South. That begins to change really starting in the, in the 40s, the 48 campaign with Strom Thurmond, of course. Uh, the Democrats had signed off on civil rights legislation at the convention in 48. Strom Thurmond and his people, they, they bolt the convention and run on a segregationist platform. Then you take it all the way to the Wallace campaign. Wallace continues that same diatribe that had been going on for 70s. They're taking over. We have to stop them. Uh, they're going to take away my freedom in the name of this thing called civil rights. And a lot of people supported Wallace. So dog whistle politics is nothing new. Not at all. But getting back to your larger, your other, your other very important question, and I think this is what you're arguing. Is it more than just racism that fuels this? Is that what you're saying? A lot of it's economic anxiety. The, uh, the jobs of yesterday, of uh, 50 years ago, they are not coming back. Um, some folks are not equipped intellectually to walk into those jobs of tomorrow. So this is why we have to make a concerted effort to, as my colleague alluded to, make sure that the playing field is open for folks to get those technical skills for the jobs of tomorrow. The culture is changing so much. You have a huge influx of people coming from outside the country into the country that are influencing the culture. So the paradigm has shifted tremendously. And there are people out there who are quite frankly very afraid. Our job, I think as educators, is to show people what has happened through the greater trajectory of history. To say, yeah, we're not all going to take your guns. We're not out to try to take anything that you have, but that the world that you grew up in is going to be different 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. 
And there is a lot of anxiety about those changes because we're in a spot technologically, culturally, intellectually, and out there, say, spiritually, that we've never been before. This is all new to us. And so people go back to what they know and what makes them feel comfortable, and sometimes it works itself out in very destructive ways. I think Dr. Clarity is 100% correct, and, and I think a lot of the that anxiety, economic anxiety, is manifesting itself as we turn against each other, and race is one of those factors as we play out that anger uh, uh, that we keep hearing about all the time in American politics today. And, and I think there's, there's several things, as Dr. Clarity alluded to, that are behind that. One is the disappearance of, of good paying jobs in this country. Since 1999, you've had over 8 million jobs that have been shipped overseas. And when our country, our government, gives tax incentives for companies to move operations overseas, uh, there's something wrong with that. And so our manufacturing base is disappearing. Uh, in 1960, over half of our jobs were in manufacturing. Today, it's down to about 12 or 13 percent and, and growing smaller. And so here we are reduced to arguing over minimum wage uh, laws because the good middle class, the jobs that created the middle class, they're gone. Uh, and so we're turning against each other because of that anger and that anxiety about uh, everyone's position in society and their ability to support their family and move, uh, move ahead. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think we need to change some policies in Washington uh, to encourage companies to uh, give them economic incentives to relocate back in this country and give them economic penalties for moving overseas. Uh, and so, you know, when, when the objective seems to be the evening up the entire world, uh, what does that do to the, uh, what was the wealthiest country on the face of the earth? Our, our uh, standard of living is sinking. Uh, fast and so that creates a lot of frustration a lot of anger by the American public and there's other things involved in that too the southern border uh, lack of security and so and that's been ongoing for decades and it's just gotten worse so uh, there's just a lot of factors in there but it, it, it has is manifesting itself in that we're turning against each other and that is not healthy for our country so I think we need to start making some policy changes in DC as far as um, what we're doing to uh, this country as far as providing job opportunities for people. As far as the uh, con Confederate flag issue, um, as, as much as folks say it's about heritage mm -hmm. and not race, uh, I think it is about race, but I think that all these other factors that my colleagues have been talking about do come into play. Um, but uh, as the great uh, uh, Kentucky writer Wendell Berry said, uh, the Confederate flag has become more than just a symbol. Uh, it's become, we you close your eyes? It's become a finger. The Confederate flag has become more than a symbol, it's become a finger. Mm -hmm. You know, take, take that. And so a lot of folks are using that, you know, as, you know, to you. And so um, uh, it, it's a it's a it's a way to say, you know, th this is a way to uh, th that 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 some folks are using to. It's a way to get back, you know, for all the frustration. But there, I I don't think there's any way of denying that race is not a factor in that. How can you deny that race is not a factor? I, I would add to that that uh, I think anybody here would be really hard pressed to find anyone who would admit to being racist. Uh, most the people I know that are in any way involved with the Klan, and I do know a few, uh, will deny that they're racist at all. Uh, so it has nothing whatsoever to do with race. They just think minorities ought to stay in their place. Uh, <laughs> And those are the same people that say, well, the, the, that flag is not about racism at all. It's, it's about Southern heritage. Well, what heritage are you talking about? Mm. Well, the one where you have <laughs> the segregation. Uh, I, I think it would be rare to find anybody who would ever call themselves a racist. 
if I may, in the recommendation of book department. Uh, Eric Fauner, yes. great historian, uh, his book on Reconstruction is really outstanding. Uh, getting back to Reconstruction, uh, President Lincoln believed that Reconstruction should be presidential and should be relatively lenient. The idea was to get these states back as quickly as possible. Now, President Lincoln was a moderate Republican. He was not a radical Republican. But the radicals argued, let's take a look at what happened here. The Confederate States of America committed treason against the United States government. They fired upon our flag. They killed our soldiers. They destroyed our property. Take Confederate away from that. That's treason. Abraham Lincoln was lawfully elected. The South lost. Fair and square election. Now, the Republicans in Congress in 1865 and 1866 were willing to go along with Lincoln's plan carried on by President Andrew Johnson, also a moderate, basically, plan. But what they wanted to see was some evidence on the part of the White South that they had accepted the verdict of the battlefield, that they had accepted that slavery was gone. The evidence was quite the contrary. Now, President Johnson hoped, and Lincoln too, that these people elected to these, con these governments in the ex-Confederate states would be unionists. Uh, Andrew Johnson was a unionist from Tennessee. When Tennessee seceded, he refused to give up his seat in the United States Senate. He became the symbol of heroic Southern unionism in the North. So who do you think these Southern states elected? They elected ex-Confederate soldiers. They elected Confederate government officials up and down the line. You also see in 1866 an increasing wave of violence against African American, violence that was encouraged by white officials. You see the organization, the Ku Klux Klan, led by General Nathan Bedford Forrest. So the people of the North said, we see no evidence that the white South has repented in any way at all from this. And as Dwayne and, and Brian both said, it was a sellout. The Northern politicians sold out the African Americans to these Southern Democrats. Why did they do it? Because they figured out that Southerners work cheap. So they're moving these factories down south to bust unions up north. That's what this is all about. Hands across the border in national unity because these Southerners, and by the way, they still work cheap. The whole <laughs> South is right to work. That's what this is all, it's economics. They sold the African Americans out into this Jim Crow era. And I used to stress to my students, when did Jim Crow end? 1960s, when I was a kid. But again, read Eric Fauner, uh, Kenneth Stamp, Air Reconstruction's a good book too. Can I recommend yes, one you another might. one? There's another one I would also uh, invite you to read if you want to look at uh, party realignments, particularly realignments, regional ones. It's a work by Nancy Weiss called Farewell to the Party of Lincoln. It's a fantastic book about the changing demographics within the American South and so far as party loyalties and the way that the party loyalties have shifted. Ergo, the reason why we have red states and blue states. Just say, I just... One more. Well, just one more question. Uh, and I, I, I can only talk locally. That's right. Uh, when the gentleman tell me sure. about what people are doing, I'm talking about here in McCracken County. I've been back for 30 years. I moved back from Milwaukee. And I'm, I'm looking at what we have here. Our black students that graduate and go on to college, the atmosphere here, none of them even dreams of coming back because of the racism and the diversity of the situation. So I'm only focusing on how do we change it around here to try to get things changed about. I'm also, my, my grandkids are interracial and they go out in the county. They had a soccer team, a softball team. 14 kids tried out. 13 made it to team. Which one didn't make it? My grandkid. And so, I, and I played with her enough to know she was a tomboy. Now I know how the mother of 13 kids wasn't that much better than her even if I had to buy her a suit to get on the team, but why you leave her out? I'm just talking about we're not getting our kids coming back and our students are going to bigger cities and different places and are achieving even the ones that's educated. I come from a family that's very well educated, 
But now, that's not the problem here. Because I know that people that are applying for some of these jobs are very well qualified education-wise. But this is an area, it's who you know, that's going to get you through the system. You can be the best qualified, because there's a lot of, I'm, I'm not getting racist, a lot of whites are being hired that's not producing as some of those that are, didn't get hired with the same qualification. So we get, I'm talking working on that problem that we have locally to change the system. If you find that there are concrete evidences of overt discrimination and you have a paper trail and you have actual proof that will stand up in a court of law, sue them and use the media, use social media to expose them for what they are. Well, we filed a lawsuit against the city of Paducah. You, you, what you're talking about there is not uh, years and years ago. You still have to have the resources right. to sue. And if you don't have the resources, a suit is not even in the picture. Lawyers do pro bono work. Trust me on this. Very quickly, let me you let go ahead. You haven't asked a question yet. We'll get to you if we if we do. We're running out of time, so make this pretty brief. And Professor Watts is going to go to class, and Professor Nickel, you have to go to class pretty soon. So if we can wrap this up, that would be great. We retirees, you know, we don't have anything to do. You know. I'm from New Orleans, so it's been very interesting to hear everything. Um, the first time I was exposed to racism was age of five when I got called the N-word. I didn't even know what it was, so I, I said, no, you're, you know, sit it back, just being kind of sassy. But um, I think the geographical anxiety, you brought up anxiety, the geographical anxiety is very different. Um, in Mississippi, people are still getting lynched. Not a person, people are still getting lynched. Um, but you don't hear much noise about that. You might hear noise in Charleston, um, you know, played very big in the media, but that anxiety, um, it's, it's very much there. You just you might not hear about it. So I would argue that in a, in a bigger city, it's, it's very different. I'm, I'm from New Orleans, like I said. Um, the anxiety is kind of in, in the undertone. It's in the inner workings, in the infrastructure of the system there. And in a lot of big cities, that's how it is. You may seem very progressive, but in the infrastructure of it, there's still very much anxiety. When I go for a job interview in a big city, I always have to wonder in the back of my head, <coughs> is there a, a quota for diversity there? Is there, you know, are they just looking at me because I'm black and not because I'm well educated? So I think um, that that anxiety is, is definitely there, that racial tension is definitely there. It just makes different types of noises, you know, different types of noises in different areas uh, around the South and the nation in general. And it's not just a southern problem, I assure you. I lived in Chicago for seven years. It, it is the same type of overtone. It's a little bit more subtle, but it's still there. Very quickly. Two minutes. Um, ultimately, it's going to come down to individuals uh, making choices. The most powerful thing that we have uh, is the power to choose. Um, and understanding that, uh, aligning ourselves with uh, the truth that I am, uh, to quote, I am somebody, mm -hmm. and we are all somebody, and I'm going to uh, uh, fix my eyes on what is what is good, uh, what is kind, and I'm going to pursue that. I am going to encounter individuals who will push back against that. I understand that. I expect it. I'm not going to go through this, this life with blinders on thinking that uh, they're naive enough to think that uh, there are not, there's not going to be pushback. There are always, there will always will be and there always have been. But that's not going to deter me from where I want to be and where I want to do. And I think that's the message as educators that we can pass on and, and encourage our young people that are in front of us. Uh, that yes, this is going to be a challenge. Are you up for it? We have about one minute left. Any of the panelists want to make a final comment before we go? Right. Okay. I, I think I've said all that needs to be said. Honored to be here today, and thank you all for coming. It is. It is. And before we go, if you would mind a round of applause for the panelists as well as for yourself for coming. Thank you all very much. Thank you.